I thank the other speakers for making the points for me because it means I don't have to reiterate the point that no, no, free speech is not some right-wing reframing of whatever. It's the foundation of Western civilization upon this civilization is built and the Enlightenment values that led to it. On November 18th, 2022, the Oxford Union held a debate on the motion this house believes woke culture has gone too far. Eight speakers were present, four in favor, four against. But the speech that went viral came from Constantine Kisson, co-host of the Trigonometry podcast, arguing that yes, indeed, woke culture has gone too far. His speech was primarily focused on the nature of climate activism in relation to the issue. After all the speeches, the union voted in favor of the motion 89 to 60. On February 5th, 2023, some dude screeched out a hasty reaction video, using everything he learned from other political reaction videos on the internet. It didn't go well. Maybe I'll change the background so it looks like I'm actually in a liberal cabal. There we go. Imagine you're Xi Jinping, the leader of China. What? When you were 10 years old, there was a revolution. This is the new hero of the right. Already, I can tell. The argument that he's making is basically what the fossil fuel industry wants to make it. Hey, you don't want your kids to die. We better keep drilling for oil. The way to improve the world is to work, is to create, it is to build. Okay. And the problem with woke culture is that it's trained too many young minds like yours to forget about that. Huh? Thank you very much. What is, what is this? Three million views, please. In the ensuing days, the very quiet channel suddenly got pretty loud, facing many critical opinions on the video. It wasn't so much an attack on him personally, but criticism on the way information was presented and the context that was missed. In the current world of YouTube, this is unheard of considering the typical shouting matches that comment sections devolve into. Comments came back that were long, thought-out arguments with commenters who were willing to engage in conversation. It became apparent that a valuable opportunity was missed. And so, the screechy dude went back to the drawing board and broadened his research. He watched others reacting to the video. He watched all the speakers from that night's debate. And he looked at so many articles. He committed himself to making a goodish video. That screechy dude was me. And this is that goodish video. So in this video, we are not going to react to Constantine's speech. We are instead going to go more in depth into the main themes of his speech. And I want to make this clear at the beginning. This is not going to be a takedown of his speech. Uh, he makes points that are worth looking at more closely, and I wanted to do that here. However, uh, by the end of this video, you'll see that I have broader criticisms that can be made that are less about the speech itself and more to do with why it exists and why we're all talking about it. So many people pointed out in the first video that you can't really argue a point of view unless you really listen to the opposition. Let's discuss the actual point Constantine was making. Uh, let's discuss part one climate change, and poverty. In his speech, Constantine Kisson made the case that the war on climate change is going to be fought in Asia and Latin America by poor people who don't care about global warming. Because the future of the climate is going to be decided in Asia and in Latin America by poor people who couldn't give a shit about saving the planet. Note that I may occasionally refer to climate change as global warming, uh, because they are the same phenomenon. Uh, the term only changed because Frank Luntz, who was an advisor to the Bush administration, uh, thought climate change sounded less scary, a move that he apparently regrets today. Climate change is usually talked about in more overarching problems, and global warming is the phenomenon itself of the, the actual planet heating up. But still, it's the same basic phenomenon. Now, at first... Constantine's statement sounds pretty mean toward poor people, right? But if you take a step back, 
it becomes clear what he's saying. It's not that poor people don't care about climate change, it's that they're not in a position to prioritize it. If you're focusing on putting food on the table and clothes on your children's back and paying your bills, well then the idea of reducing carbon emissions seems like, well, let's just say it, a rich man's problem. It is perceived as an issue that academics in the West can ponder over during a liquid lunch at a bespoke cafe. <laughs> Asking impoverished people in India or China, as Kissin mentions, to change their way of life in the name of climate change is just not feasible. Kissin goes on to pose a hypothetical question where a parent has to choose between their child's welfare and carbon emissions. Either my son had a serious risk of starving or dying from a preventable disease in the next year, or I could press a button and he would live. He would go to school. He would bring his first girlfriend home. But all I have to do is press this button. And for every day of my son's life, a giant plume of CO2 is going to re get released into the atmosphere. Now, you're all very young, and most of you are not parents. Let me tell you something. There is not a parent in the world who would not smash that button so hard their hand bled. All right, so is that an either-or choice? Well, not if you were to ask Oxfam, a charity that has been fighting for equality and justice for nearly a century. One of their stated goals is to end poverty. Another is climate action. Oxfam states on their website that climate change, poverty, and inequality are linked, citing droughts, floods, and storms as effects that will hit poor communities first. This can cause unpredictable growing seasons, crop failures, and sharp increases in food prices. It can also lead to displacement, an estimated 20 million people have been forced from their homes over the last decade because of climate disasters. If you are in a vulnerable community, like the exhaustively poor in Asia and Latin America that KK mentions, rising food prices and less agricultural land are going to have an effect on you. But let's be honest here. The time frame for a climate catastrophe seems pretty far down the road, right? Climate activists are currently trying to keep us under a 2.5 degree Celsius increase, but we're not looking to hit that until 2040. According to NASA, the amount of land consumed by wildfires in the western United States is projected to increase two to six times what it is currently, but that won't take full effect until 2050. We are looking at a rise in sea level of about a foot, possibly eight feet, if we don't change any of our carbon policies, but that's not projected out until the end of the century. Sure, the intensity and frequency of hurricanes is increasing, but we've actually been dealing with that increase since the 1980s. So with all that said, what does Constantine Kissin think we should do? Well, at the end of his speech, he says that we need to use technology to create energy sources that are not only clean, but also cheap. I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, there is only one thing we can do in this country to stop climate change, and that is to make scientific and technological breakthroughs that will create the clean energy that is not only clean, but also cheap. Now, he doesn't actually mention what some of those would be in his speech. So, you know what? Let's look at some of that now. Part two, green technology. I don't have all the answers, no one does, but I can give you some ideas that are worth considering. First, let's look at wind power, which produces far less carbon emissions than fossil fuels. It's clean, renewable, it's a domestic resource, and it already employs 120,000 people in the U.S. right now. It might vary in usefulness depending on how much wind you get, and you do have to take into account the threat to birds and, of course, the noise. There is also the possibility of freezing, as we saw in Texas back in 2021, although that can be easily rectified by, you know, winterizing the turbines. Note that the Texas freeze in 2021 was not the first time that that happened. In 2011, uh, Texas also saw extreme cold temperatures that affected wind turbines, natural gas lines, and coal plants. 
uh, a decade later, the state had still not made the necessary investments to prevent them from tripping offline. Okay, here's one that always interested me. Three-layer solar panels. So do you remember the Mars rover that had its cute little solar wings that flared out? Yeah, those were three-layer solar panels. They not only absorb yellow light like a traditional solar panel, but also red and blue light, which raises their conversion efficiency from 15% to 35%. The problem, as you can guess, is that those panels are, right now, very expensive. It costs NASA millions of dollars to implement them. But, as with most technologies, the price keeps falling as it gets implemented more broadly. It's the reason your 100-inch 16K television or whatever uh, costs about as much as an old cathode ray tube television cost back in the 80s. Also good for developed nations is nuclear power plants. No, not the fission plants that we're used to, uh, although those are pretty clean by comparison to coal or oil. No, I'm talking about nuclear fusion plants, which use electromagnets to create a mini-sun. So you can smash atoms together. This is, believe it or not, far safer as nuclear fusion creates a stable isotope instead of fission's highly unstable radioactivity. Nuclear fusion waste does not create greenhouse gases, and it doesn't have long-lived radioactive elements. However, there are experts that have had criticism of fusion plants because they may not produce enough energy when you consider how much you have to use to run them, because again, you're making a mini-sun, so that takes some power. Oh no, environmentalist, did I say nuclear power? How dare I? Uh, but actually, as it turns out, attitudes toward nuclear power has changed dramatically among climate activists, especially in the last few years, as it is proving to be a really good way to get off of fossil fuels and move people away from coal. Those climate activists, by the way, happen to include a certain St. Greta of climate change, Greta Thunberg herself. I will join you in worshipping at the feet of St. Greta of climate change. Those are a couple possibilities, but it might not help impoverished communities. So, what can we do for them? Well, luckily, as it turns out, clean, affordable energy is not the only thing you can do to address these issues. While I was looking through a bunch of articles, I came across this piece from Yusuf Jamil back in May 16th, 2022, discussing Project Drawdown from the UN. The headline states, we must prioritize activities that address both poverty and climate. Now that's a really nice statement, but there is some actual depth to this. Jamil cites 28 readily available, financially viable, and scientifically proven strategies for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions that can also provide tangible benefits in the form of enhanced prosperity and equity for the people experiencing poverty in low- and middle-income countries, which was distilled from more than 400 scientific papers. That's a really long way of saying, we looked at a lot of scientific data and we came up with some strategies. Anyway, this seemed kind of pertinent, so I dug a little deeper. What are those strategies? Well, in addition to providing clean energy and adopting clean cooking, those solutions include things like regenerative cropping, tree intercropping, and agroforestry. It, basically, it's planting trees. Not only does this help with greenhouse gases, but minimizes damages for farmers from high temperatures and droughts. The thing is, younger generations are already aware of this, as is evident by the YouTuber initiative hashtag Team Trees. But don't worry, it's not just the YouTuber thing. Uh, from Ethiopia's Green Legacy Initiative, to the Bond Challenge in Germany, to the Nature Conservancy's Plant a Billion Trees campaign, reforestation is actually a big effort being addressed right now. This is not performative activism. This is direct action that deals with both poverty and climate change simultaneously. It turns out that you can actually deal with both of these issues at the same time, and you don't even need to do it by implementing new technology. You can use technologies and strategies that we already have 
in order to affect major change. But there is one big hurdle that we need to address. Part 3, Rocking the Boat. In 1996, GM introduced the EV1. It was a car that was quiet, ran purely on electric, and had zero emissions. For most of the population, this would have gotten us over our reliance on gas as a fuel source for vehicles. However, the cars were only leased, and you couldn't buy them. GM wouldn't let you. After pressure from the auto industry, California removed the state's mandate that would require 10% of all vehicles in the state to be electric. By 2004, GM told current EV1 drivers they could not renew their leases and required that they be turned back to the company. Ultimately, the last cars were crushed in 2005, never to be heard from again. You probably know this story because of a little documentary called Who Killed the Electric Car, which I definitely recommend you watch if you get the chance. It's very well done. But this was not actually the first electric vehicle. They started showing up before the earliest gas cars. The first crude electric vehicles showed up in the 1830s although they would not debut in the U.S. until the turn of the century. Here's a picture of Thomas Edison with his first electric car, the Edison Baker, and one of its batteries, circa 1895. Here is the Mercury Arc Rectifier Charging Set, powering up an electric car in Cleveland, Ohio, circa 1910. So what happened? Well, the Ford Model T and a drop in oil prices would be the thing that killed off the electric car the first time. Still, it's crazy to think that we were working on electric vehicles before the American Civil War. So why do I bring this up? Well, in his speech, Constantine said that what we need to do is create new technologies in order to get off of fossil fuels. We sit on this side of the house because we know that the way to improve the world is to work is to create, it is to build. But we did. We, we did create new technologies. The EV1 is an example of creating a new technology to combat dirty energy, which was built to be a production car, had popularity amongst its user base, used an existing infrastructure people were already used to, and it was affordable, but existing industries saw it as a threat, so it needed to be destroyed. It's not enough to build and innovate. You need to successfully challenge the status quo, people who are already in power. Interlude. So when I was researching this and started writing the script, I realized that there are a lot of people that are going to be watching this video that may take issue with some of the sources and organizations that I cite in the video. Because of this, I tried to vary the outlets so you knew that I wasn't just getting information from one source. However, and I cannot stress this enough, there is no such thing as an unbiased news source. And any criticism that you might have on a news outlet and their validity, is completely justified. It's a good thing to think critically about news media. I will pose a question to you, though. Where did Constantine get his data? Do you know? He used a few statistics in that speech, but I couldn't find anything in the video descriptions of the trigonometry or the Oxford Union versions that I could reference. So, I thought I'd look it up. I have to tell you that I don't know for sure where he got this data. I can just tell you what I was able to find. For starters, 20% of Russians not having indoor plumbing. I come from Russia, which is not a poor country, it's a middle-income country. 20% of households in Russia do not have an indoor toilet. The most relevant article I could find was from 2019 in the Moscow Times. Now, it appears that they got their data from Russian state statistics service Rostat. Uh, the number at the time was 22.6% of households without a centralized sewage system. I'm pretty sure that's what he's talking about. 
Second was the number of malnourished people in China. 120 million people in China do not have enough food. I don't mean that they don't get dessert. I mean they suffer from malnutrition. I was able to find a lot of articles on hunger around the world, and in China specifically, but not the 120 million number he mentioned. Now the closest thing I could find came from the World Food Program. Which states that 150.8 million people are malnourished in China. Now, interestingly enough, in the same article from the World Food Program, it states the WFP signed a memorandum to work with the Chinese government to reduce poverty and improve vulnerable communities to withstand climate shocks. Back in 2016. Now, perhaps that 120 million number is more recent data following that memorandum. I just can't find it. <laughs> third, he mentions poverty in India. A third of all children who live in extreme poverty in the world live in India. Now, at first, I thought he meant a third of India's population, due to a Borshin Project article about poverty and corruption. Where it mentions 50 million people still live in extreme poverty as of 2019, despite decreasing rates. I thought I found the data he mentioned in a 2021 article from the Pew Research Center discussing poverty rates changing during the pandemic, but it specifically states that 30 percent of the world's low-income population is in India, not the amount in extreme poverty. So. I ventured over to the World Poverty Clock, the funnest site on the internet. Okay, so I wanted to show you this directly,、uh, just so that you can see. So this is World Data Lab, the World Poverty Clock. I, I don't know how much better or more pertinent data I could possibly give you, but this actually tracks specifically extreme poverty, and you can see India right here. Of、uh, 44 million people currently living in extreme poverty, you'll notice that in terms of the overall continents, there are places that have rising poverty that's pretty significant. But okay, poverty relative around the world—that's what we're on right now. And you're going to see that, yeah,、uh, India does indeed have pretty high extreme poverty. For the world population, but it's 7.4 percent. There are countries in Africa like Nigeria and the Congo that have over 11 percent of the world's extreme poverty. Now he did say children. So if if I go up here, I can I can look specifically at age groups. So let's see if I can just select all of the. Children's ones here. Okay, and then we're going to look now. If I look in the age ranges all the way from zero to nineteen, which I would think constitutes kids, it's six point three percent of the people in the world in the selected age range that are living in extreme poverty. Not good, mind you, but not a third. Six percent is not a third. Six point three, and if I go over here, remember he said Latin America. Well, here's Latin America, and if you look at extreme poverty in these places, it's not high.、Uh, and if I go back out, like just to all age ranges, just so that I can give you a better idea, it doesn't really change much. So, in conclusion, I really don't know what he means by a third of all children in the world in extreme poverty are in India. It, I, no matter how I cut this, no matter what articles I looked at, I can't find anything even close to that number. So, if you want to take issue with my sources, I welcome you to do research on your own. Look at multiple sources, ask questions, try to answer them. But do yourself a favor and ask the same questions of the viral speech on the internet that you saw. And with that being said, let's finally move on to part four: climate activism. So, climate activism—does it actually accomplish anything? Can you 
just complain to the manager and get what you want. Uh, well, let's take the example that Constantine mentions about throwing soup on paintings. To believe that what you must do to improve the world is to complain, is to protest, is to throw soup on paintings. In October 2022, protesters from Just Stop Oil chucked tomato soup on Van Gogh's sunflowers, an $80 million painting, ruining it forever. Well, no, uh, the painting was actually under glass, and the National Gallery of London stated it was unharmed except for minor damage to the frame. Just Stop Oil would later come out to confirm that they specifically chose sunflowers because they knew that it was under glass and would not have gone through this stunt otherwise. Now, if the purpose was to generate awareness, it certainly seems like it accomplished that, as it feels like we've been talking about it for decades now. But you probably didn't hear much about the activists from last generation in Italy who, just a month later, threw pea soup on Van Gogh's The Sour, which was also under glass and only had minor damage to the frame. So this might not be a great long-term form of activism, but why art? Right? Why target museums to protest oil? Well, it's because of a fascinating thing I found out about while researching this video called Art washing. Turns out the fossil fuel companies will fund art and cultural programs to take focus away from them being um, fossil fuel companies. It's worth noting that some museums, including the National Gallery, have been cutting ties with oil company sponsorship over the last decade. Take, for instance, British Petroleum and Tate Galleries, who ended their partnership of 26 years in 2017. This followed a multitude of protests at Tate Britain in the years prior. BP claimed the challenging business environment was behind the decision. Similarly, the National Portrait Gallery and BP decided to end their partnership in 2022, after 30 years following numerous protests. The National Theatre and Royal Shakespeare Company ended their sponsorship deals with Shell and BP respectively in 2019, after Mark Rylance resigned in protest over the partnership. And just this year, BP announced that they were cutting ties with the Royal Opera House after 33 years following disruptions by activist groups like Extinction Rebellion. So, yeah, actually, it turns out that climate activism does succeed in putting enough pressure on institutions to change things. Now, whether this has any long-term effects on the profits of those oil companies is very debatable. Uh, I doubt BP or Shell is going to stop selling oil because they can't proudly state that they're not sponsoring the newest production of Romeo and Juliet, but it's also not good press for them. So, to recap, we can fight climate change and poverty at the same time. There are more ways to do that than just creating clean energy sources. Uh, it is not enough to build a system. You also have to challenge the status quo. And it turns out that climate activism has actually managed to influence institutions, albeit mostly for publicity reasons. So with all that said, we can finally end the video. There's nothing else we need to talk about. Well, there is one other thing. Part 5. Why does this speech exist? I'm not talking about the content of Constantine's speech now. I'm talking about the reasons why we're discussing it. So what do we know? Well, we know that Oxford Union, now celebrating 200 years of debates, hosted eight speakers to discuss the motion, This House Believes Woke Culture Has Gone Too Far. And to get a better perspective on this debate, I watched all eight speeches. And I can tell you, I do not recommend it. It was not fun, and I can never get that hour of my life back. Uh, Piers Morgan branded me the wokest man in Britain. To, to which I said, please, Piers, don't assume my gender. 
if you're not sure who Alex Jackson is, he's just the least well-known committee member from New College. So irrelevant that he's on the term card as Alex Jackman. It's not at all surprising to me that she's arguing against modern social attitudes tonight. After all, she has spent the last two years of her degree living thousands and thousands of years in the past. <laughs> Their tactics rely on coordinated, coercive attempts to win a debate by ending the debate. The goal is to punish, not educate. No, thank you. No, thank you. With all due respect, thank you for the invitation, but this debate is absurd. Mr. Young was outraged when PayPal shut down his Free Speech Union accounts as a result of him retweeting misinformation about the COVID infection rates. Let's just hope for all of our sakes that he's learned his lesson and has managed to find reliable sources for tonight. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, freedom of speech should not be, should not mean freedom from consequences. I wonder if you'd include what happened to Salman Rushdie earlier this year as a consequence of uh, free speech. But look, I'm sure she'll be a formidable speaker tonight, but I just hope she's put enough, as much effort into her speech as she does into continually posting on her Instagram story. <laughs> I was really honored to be invited to do a debate at the Oxford Union, but also incredibly nervous when I saw what the subject was and who was in opposition. And I was nervous because it feels like a strangely personal topic. Only a couple of weeks ago, he sparked a furious debate on Twitter when he made the unbelievable claim that Marmite was the work of the devil. I will join you in worshiping at the feet of St. Greta of climate change. If, if the well, okay, um, I don't think of um, Great Britain and Northern Ireland as um, one country colonizing another, as I understand it. About 15 months ago, my wife got pregnant. Not me, because we're old school. <laughs> Transgender warlords, they'd have you believe if you were to read the Daily Telegraph comment section. No offence to those of you that write for the Daily Telegraph comment section. <laughs> Firstly, woke culture prioritises performative displays above real social justice. No. In fact, to interrupt someone speaking on behalf of social justice is again to reinscribe violence and do epistemic injustice to people who are fighting to end oppression. As in George Orwell's 1984, obviously familiar to many of you here, it's fairly close, but still a majority want to be part of the United Kingdom. Um, so let me, let me just go on. The whole's a collected, fermented memory of the last 10,000 visits. In a short space of time, we've gone from having hashtags like hashtag stay woke, which derived from black American protesters pleading for people to be more conscious of inequalities, to phrases like go woke, go broke encouraging multi-million pound corporations to stop caring about inequality, which sounds kind of counterproductive to me. How many of you are going to go home tonight and say, let's rip out our bathroom and erect a Siberian shithouse in the back garden? Grievance industrial complex, the great awakening, Wokers Day. What um, Orwell would have referred to as a smelly little orthodoxy. New words, euphemisms, paraphrases appear to replace those now deemed offensive. Intersectionality cult, the oppression Olympics, uh, the uh, critical theories, as James Lindsay would put it. And while I was in London a couple of days ago, I might have visited Karl Marx's grave and danced on it. I'd go further and say that the terror tactics of the woke movement uh, uh, actively harm the disadvantaged groups they're seeking to help. Really, this question is an argument about power and who has the right to claim it. And our stocks of polar bears are running extremely low. Whilst I'm sure my inner Carrie Bradshaw would find the search for Mr. Woke thrilling, it is worth noting the duality of the term. What art and culture has the woke cult given rise to? Uh, Xi Hulk, attorney at law. Imagine you're Xi Jinping, the leader of China. The professor has refused to continue in academia, at least in the UK, quoting the ideological capture of its institutions. Now, personally, having grown up in a communist regime, these sentiments are all too familiar to me. Fortunately, I've not observed anything to this effect in our home here in Oxford. Let's take an example of an opponent to woke culture who's been invited to this debate, me. No, 
In order to give us a working definition of woke, it is important to, disti di to distinguish between the values that being woke is supposed to represent. By the way, I think the term, as we've kind of all agreed, woke culture is a bit of an absurd as a term. If you go further back to the 1800s, there was a German teacher and clinician called Emma Trost, who was the first known woman to publish scientific works on homosexuality, specifically lesbianism. We are well aware of the importance of having a free and open discourse. And the articles were censored and banned. It's a bit too woke for the time. Um, sorry, you're gonna kill my flow. Could we just like, wait, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm six wines in at this point. There's been delays. Um, <laughs> I'll get to that afterwards. If you think slavery is abhorrent, why focus on the historical involvement of Britain and America in the slave trade and turn a blind eye to the enslavement of nigh on two million Uyghurs in contemporary China. Conscientization is the essence of woke because it is the idea that you learn to see these things so that you can denounce these things so that you can denounce them critically in order to announce the possibility of our liberation from them. It's a cultural desert, a gaping void. We need to reset and reclaim this word for what it actually means, not the political tool that the right wing has turned into. That now, I suspect, probably not a person in this room thinks that being gay should be a criminal act in this country. Of course, almost nobody would think that today. I'm at the center of identifying the sexualization of children through queer theory as groomer behavior. Under woke culture, language, art, culture, politics, and many more avenues must be cleansed of their inflammatory content. There has become a tribal necessity for virtue signaling. The only way to do that, under the understanding of woke, is to denounce the existing society until it no longer stands. But the existing society, hanging by a thread as it is, still exists. No! And uh, if you're not persuaded to vote for the proposition tonight by that speech by James, I don't know what will persuade you. After all the speeches, the union voted in favor of the motion 89 to 60. Around the same time, Cambridge University debated the motion, This House Believes in the Right to Offend, and saw a similar outcome in favor of the motion by a margin of 247 to 72. And after this? Well, nothing happened, really. These debates don't hold any actionable items. No policies change because of them. Perhaps, if they are lucky, the speakers will gain some kind of exposure to their new projects, or they'll get invited on talk shows. But from a practical standpoint, nothing changes. Fun fact, a week after this, Oxford Union held another debate with eight more speakers. The topic... This house regrets the rise of hookup culture. I hate it here. You may have noticed that I avoided talking about woke culture up to this point, and that was on purpose. Because if I started talking about that, we wouldn't really be talking about climate activism or poverty or global warming anymore. Personally, I think the House was right to affirm the motion that woke culture has gone too far, because what I realized after doing all of this research on the substance of Constantine's speech is that by framing everything through the lens of being woke or not, we lose focus of the issues at hand. It sucks all the air out of the room before we even get around to talking about what the problem is. During the other seven speeches that night, we heard about racial injustice, performative activism, freedom of speech, identity politics, women in Iran, gender equality, the Uyghur Muslims in China, and, of course, She-Hulk. Now, these are all subjects worth discussing on their own, except She-Hulk. But the problem is, is that by framing it as doing a woke... We now have to lump them all together into one debate. It's like having half the house argue that ice cream is delicious, and the other half argue that frozen yogurt is bad. I mean, they both make valid arguments, but they're not exactly the same thing. 
As I stepped back and took that thousand-yard view of what I was watching, I realized something. I was witnessing academics in fancy dress debating the plight of the common man in a 200-year-old institution, bemusing each other and genuflecting to their base for brownie points, putting on a performance and signaling their respective virtues to the crowd, knowing full well that the vote taken at the end of the night would hold no weight, carry no action. And I know that these debates don't have any long-term impact, mostly because of a very famous one held 60 years ago. And this is where I get to do a fun thing. Finally. Because I actually watched another debate for this video, and I get to talk about it now. So, let me welcome two titans of public discourse to discuss a topic that you might find pertinent even today. What this does to the subjugated the most private, the most serious thing this does to the subjugated is to destroy his sense of reality. It destroys, for example, his, uh, his father's authority over him. His father can no longer tell him anything because the past has disappeared. And his father has no power in the world. This means, in the case of an American Negro, born in that glittering republic, and in the moment you are born, since you don't know any better, Every stick and stone and every face is white. And since you have not yet seen a mirror, you suppose that you are too. It comes as a great shock around the age of five or six or seven to discover that the flag to which you have pledged allegiance, <laughs> along with everybody else, has not pledged allegiance to you. It comes as a great shock to discover that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians when you were rooting for Gary Cooper that the Indians were you. It comes as a great shock to discover that the country, which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity, has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. How are we going to avoid the kind of humiliations that are perpetually visited on members of a minority race? Obviously, the first element is concern. We've got to care that it happens. We have got to do what we can to change the warp and woof of moral, moral thought in society in such fashion as to try to make it happen less and less. Let me urge this point to you, which I can do with authority, my friends, the only thing that I can tonight. And that is to tell you uh, that in the United States, there is a concern for the Negro problem. Now, if you get up to me and say, <laughs> uh, if you get up to me and say, well, now, is there the kind of concern that we students of Cambridge would show if the problem were our own? Uh, all I can say is I don't know. It may very well be uh, that there has been some sort of a sunburst of moral enlightenment that has hit this community, uh, so as to make it predictable that if you were the governors of the United States, the situation would change overnight. I'm prepared to grant this as a, a form of courtesy, Mr. President. Uh, uh, but meanwhile, uh, I'm saying to you that the engines of concern in the United States are working. The presence of Mr. Baldwin here tonight is in part a reflection of that concern. When the ex-attorney general, Mr. Robert Kennedy, said that it was conceivable that in 40 years in America we might have a Negro president. And that sounded like a very emancipated statement, I suppose, to white people. They were not in Harlem when this statement was first heard and did not hear and possibly will never hear the laughter and the bitterness and the scorn in which the statement was greeted. From the point of view of the man in the Harlem barbershop, Bobby Kennedy only got here yesterday. And now he's already on his way to the presidency. We've been here for 400 years and now he tells us that maybe in 40 years, if you're good, we may let you become president. 
I don't think it matters that there are 35 millionaires among the Negro community. If there were 35, if there were 20 million uh, millionaires among the Negro community of the United States, I would still agree with you that we have a dastardly situation. But I'm asking you not, uh, not to make politics as the crow flies, to use the fleeted phrase of Professor Oakshock, but rather to consider what, in fact, is it that we Americans ought to do? What are your instructions that I'm to take back to the United States, my friend? <laughs> uh, I want to know what it is that we should do, and especially I want to know uh, whether it is time, in fact, to abandon the American dream as it has been defined by Mr. Haycock Mr. Burford. On February 18, 1965, James Baldwin and William F. Buckley Jr. held a debate at the University of Cambridge on the topic... The motion before the House tonight is, the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. Have you seen this debate? You gotta go watch this debate. Buckley and Baldwin make these modern-day speakers look like children playing in a sandbox while the two of them are sipping cocktails in a lounge. <laughs> First of all, Baldwin is simply captivating here. He was an acclaimed author at the time for Another Country, but his previous works included Go Tell It on the Mountain, Giovanni's Room, and Notes of a Native Son. You can't pull your attention away when he starts talking. Even when he pauses, it feels like he is speaking volumes. The economy, especially of the southern states, could not conceivably be what it has become if they had not had, and do not still have indeed, and for so long, so many generations, cheap labor. I am stating very seriously, and this is not an overstatement, that I picked the cotton, and I carried it to market. And I built the railroads under someone else's whip for nothing. For nothing. Buckley was a troll before trolling was a thing. Dude wrote postcards to Ayn Rand in liturgical Latin just because he knew it would piss her off and then bragged about it in her obituary. He founded the National Review, he hosted Firing Line for decades. He was one of the founding thinkers of modern American conservatism, and you can imagine that his opinions on things are very problematic. He also has, like, an off-putting air here. I don't know if it's his Atlantic accent or if it's just kind of the way he, he scrunches up. But he is also very entertaining to watch. <laughs> Fourteen times as many people in New York City born of Negroes are illegitimate as of whites. This is a problem. How shall we address it? Uh, by seeking out laws that encourage illegitimacy in white people? Uh, this, unfortunately, tends to be the rhetorical momentum that some of their arguments are taking. One thing you might do, Mr. Buckley, is let them vote Mississippi. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more and for... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, except, uh, lest I, I appear too ingratiating, which is hardly my objective here tonight, I think, actually, I think actually what is wrong in Mississippi, sir, is not that not enough Negroes are voting, but that too many white people are, are, are voting. <laughs> Even the two students who opened this debate were completely on point. Mr. William Buckley has the reputation of possibly being the most articulate conservative in the United States of America. He was a graduate of Yale, and he first gained a reputation for himself by publishing a book entitled God and Man and Yale. <laughs> this debate is not whether civil rights should be extended to American Negroes or not. If it were, it would be a very easy motion to argue for and a very easy motion to vote for. The debate tonight uh, concerns whether the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. That is, whether the American Negro has paid for the American dream with his suffering, or whether the American dream has furthered Negro inequality. And I would deny both those two precepts. 
237 Negroes, king among them, were arrested. The following day, 470 children who had deserted their classrooms to protest against King's arrest were charged with juvenile delinquency. <laughs> 36 adults on the same day were charged with contempt of court for picketing the courthouse while state circuit court was in session. On the following day, 111 people were arrested on the same charge despite their claim that they merely wanted to see the voting registrar. The average per capita <coughs> income of Negroes in America is exactly the same as the average per capita income of people in Great Britain. Now, I found that absolutely... <laughs> I found that absolutely amazing, and I, I understand that. <laughs> now, you might notice something familiar about what they're talking about here. They're talking about racial inequality. And once all the votes were counted, Baldwin absolutely body slammed Buckley with the House affirming the motion. They voted in favor of that motion 544 persons and against 164 persons. The motion is therefore carried by 380 votes. I declare the House to stand adjourned. And afterwards, racism ended. And the black population was compensated for their labor, and everyone joined hands to sing Kumbaya. Well, actually, no, that didn't happen. A Gallup poll in 1966 showed that two-thirds of the country had an unfavorable opinion of Martin Luther King Jr., in 1968, he was assassinated. This followed sustained surveillance by the FBI on his civil rights movement. Debates are a tough thing to quantify in terms of actual change, sort of like climate activism. Both serve to call attention to a problem with the intent of getting others to think about it more deeply. They are not really for the people who participate. They are for everyone else who will bear witness to them. The point is the action that others do in response to it. Which brings us to our final question. Part 6. Why does this video exist? And finally, we arrive here, at the end of this video, having looked so broadly at this issue that I am currently in low Earth orbit. Yes, folks, I guess I checked my privilege and did my research. You are welcome. But why I made this video has a lot to do with all of you. You see, Oxford Union holds a debate, which leads to Constantine Kisson's viral speech, which led to the screechy dude, you remember from the first video, which led to many do criticisms, which led to me making this video after way too much time invested. <laughs> One thing leads to the next. But I have good news for all of you. There is something real that has come out of this whole experience. And it's something that happened to me. I have determined that I do not want to be woke or anti-woke. I want to be woke neutral. I'm woke Switzerland now. Swokeserland. Now, that doesn't really mean that I've changed any of my opinions overnight. I still believe that we need to confront the sins of our past in order to build a better future. I still believe that a debt owed is a debt owed. I still believe that strong civilizations have to teach their historical truth and not revel in their own mythology. I still want others to have the same opportunity and respect that I have been given. But I don't want those opinions to be viewed through the lens of whether they're woke or not. And I don't want to make decisions based on where they fall on a mystical wokeness scale. I realized that was the big problem with Kissin's speech. He starts out talking about how woke culture is bad, but then he spends almost the entire time talking about climate change and poverty. Climate change and poverty should have been the whole point of the speech, not filler to discuss wokeness or something. It's all just noise at that point, distracting us from issues that we are all facing, some very large and some very She-Hulk. I think Kissin said it best in that speech. I am so tired of talking about woke culture. Constantine, I'm right there with you, buddy. That's it. That's the video. 
Uh, thank you if you've stuck around to this point. Uh, everybody gets a theoretical gold star. If, if you've made it this far, you definitely deserve a participation trophy. There were even a bunch of topics I realized I just couldn't get into. Like, I started thinking about going into the idea of why people are so poor in the countries that he mentioned, or if poor people are actually responsible for climate change, because a lot of it is actually going to be the burden of industries and corporations. I also thought about talking about climate change through the years and some of the effects that it has had on our world right now. There were just there were there were so many aspects, and then I had to pare it all down because I realized that this will spiral out of control, and it it had already taken a really long time to put together. Um, this is a very different sort of video for me, and I don't know if anyone's even going to watch it. But I wanted to at least make the effort to make a good faith and more thorough argument to respond to that speech than what I did before, which was pretty much just, I got time to kill in an afternoon, let's scream into a camera. I think I realized past all of that, I don't really want to do that kind of video anyway. So uh, I, I want to again really just sincerely thank everybody who made critiques of me on that to to explain that that wasn't good. I found this to be much more insightful and interesting, for me at least, and hopefully all of you can take something away from it as well. Oh right, your uh, prophecy for the day. I still do that at the end of videos. Uh, if you don't have anything nice to say, come up with a biting insult. Was that smart for me to say? I feel like I shouldn't have said that at the end. Like, now I'm just going to have a bunch of biting insults. In the Actually, I'd love to know what your biting insults are. Do that. If, if you don't have anything constructive that you wanted to say in comments, just, just tell me what your best biting insult is. I, I need some for the next time I have to deal with insufferable people. I need the best biting insults you got.